George Wilkinson. Um, a late stage PhD candidate in geography and planning who will be presenting his project titled A Scarcity of Large Non-Capital Cities, a National Analysis of the Drivers of Urban Primacy in Australian States. So uh, George's research examines Australian settlement patterns within the context of institutional economics under the supervision of Professor Fiona Haslam McKenzie uh, from the Centre of Regional Development and the UWA Australian Urban Design Research Centre, along with Dr. Julian Bolliter. Uh, just a bit of background about George. Um, he's a management consultant with expertise in strategy, business analysis and project management. He holds a BA in Integrated Biology from the University of California, Berkeley, a Master of Science in Human Biology from UWA and an MBA from the University of Cape Town. So George's presentation will be recorded and will be available on YouTube in the coming week. And also just a friendly reminder that we'll be holding all questions until the last 10, 15 minutes of the seminar. And can I ask the audience on Zoom to just keep your microphones on mute until you um, question and answer time. So if you'd like to take it away, George. Thank you. Um, please go ahead. Thanks for the introduction. Okay, I just wanna see where everybody is. Okay. I'm also going to put a timer on so I don't go over time today. Um, right, so as was introduced, the t my, uh, my project is called A Scarcity of Large Non-Capital Cities. And in it, I'm analyzing the drivers of a phenomenon known as urban primacy. And I'll describe and explain what that means as we go. Okay, first of all, though, thank you for having me. Thank you for your time and attention today. Really appreciate it. And in terms of the disciplinary areas that we're gonna be looking at today, uh, there's sort of three general areas. So institutional economics, as was explained. So this describes the rules, of the rules that govern economic development. Also economic geography, uh, economic geographers are interested in the geography of where economic development is occurring. And then economic history. So we're gonna be talking about uh, or examining some historical elements of economic development. And I also wanna acknowledge my uh, supervisors, Fiona and Julian, who have been great champions of this research and uh, they're just excellent supervisors. Oops. Okay, so to get started, um, the first thing to look at are settlement patterns. We're gonna be talking about a settlement pattern called urban primacy. So in the image here, I have two contrasting settlement patterns to make it very clear about what we are and are not talking about. On the left, you have something that's called decentralized urbanization. And as you can see from the, these are same scale images, by the way. On the left, you have multiple large cities um, and settlement here in Canada and the United States is indicative of economic productivity. Then on the right, this is uh, Western Russia. Uh, this is a good case of urban primacy that you can see from space, again, same scale. Um, and here you have one dominantly large city and a, a sort of the, at the same exact time, you have an observable um, absence of second cities. So there's either stunted or missing second cities, arguably. Um, and this settlement is usually indicative of political geography. Almost every time you see this settlement pattern, this will be the political capital. So in my literature review, I was interested in, um, hopefully, can, can you guys still see this? That's just me. All right. Um, I did a literature review to see what correlates with urban primacy. I was interested to understand, um, yeah, what are the factors that are associated with it? And so these numbers here are indica indicate uh, peer-reviewed studies that found relationships. So uh, you can see there were 30, there are at least 36 uh, studies that I identified where capital city status was strongly associated with this settlement pattern. Also so having centralized power. So weak, weak governance below that political capital was often associated with this pattern. Um, other, area, other things that negatively associated with it, so geographic area, the larger the, the geographic area, the less likely you are to have just one city. The larger the population, the less likely you are, you are to have one city. Uh, the better uh, country is at providing regional infrastructure, the less likely it is to have one city. Um, economic development, so an interesting thing about urban primacy is that generally it's considered a poor developing country problem which is actually not really true, but it is common of developing countries. So there's been mixed results on that, um, on that factor, and there's, there's, there's probably more debate about that issue. Same with colonial history. A lot of scholars thought 
primacy was a colonial um, echo of colonization. And yet the most extreme national example, Thailand also has um, urban primacy, one of the most um, extreme cases, and it does not have a colonial history. Um, and then the last, I'll, I'll speak to the last one, urbanization. So some people will say um, they'll confound ur urbanization with urban primacy. And it's important uh, to point out that number one, papers don't find a relationship between the level that, uh, that a country is urbanized, meaning the percentage of people that live in cities um, and urban primacy. And the difference is urbanization describes people choosing to live in cities in general. Urban primacy describes people choosing to live in one city. So there's a big difference there. Um, of interest and why people look at urban primacy, uh, large research of primacy took off with the emergence of the megacity. And that's largely because uh, there's a lot of congestion costs associated with urban primacy, whether they be pollution or uh, growth losses due to congestion. So you often have industries that are co-locating that have not, that derive no benefit from being near one another, but they're just tripping over one another. I'm using broad terms to, to explain that. There's also, um, in theory, a suppression cost. So as I'd mentioned, there's cities missing here. So there's untapped potential, arguably, in these secondary cities. This is much more difficult to measure, whereas congestion is a little bit simpler. And the literature does tend to ironically focus on the primate city and not the shadow land. But in theory, uh, sorry, I think I lost my mic. In theory, there's, there's quite significant suppre uh, suppression costs. And I, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. So what's this have to do with Australia? So number one, Australia is not a poor country, so it would be not a, a likely candidate for having urban primacy, as many people would expect. It's an advanced, it's capitalist, it's a democratic federation. Um, however, at the state level and formerly the colonial level, Australia had very early onset and persistent experience of urban primacy. And I provided this image to sort of show you the state lines and the light, the, 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 uh, the white represents cities. Um, each state has a, a, an extreme measure of urban primacy, and I'll, I'll give you some benchmarks. Um, in general, after it was recognized that Australia had primacy, there was early concern that gradually gave away to resignation and a degree of environmental determinism, that the, the environment was very harsh in Australia. Really, you could only have one city, and, and this is really what, what we're going to get. Um, that said, and, and just so you're aware, the ABS is projecting that primacy will increase this century. So the capitals are going to increase their proportion of population. Um, that's ex at least the projection. Of, we, we don't really know in COVID. These projections were made before COVID, so maybe that will change slightly. Uh, and in general, there's been repeated and ongoing federal and state interest to decentralize population growth. So um, in my historical literature review, you'll find every decade or so there's a debate and sometimes proper programs to try to move people out of the capitals and into non-capital cities. And I gave an example called DIRD, which was the Department of Urban and Regional Development, which was established in the 70s. It had a short life. You'll find many of these programs do. When government changes, they're put down. Um, but it was one of the more notable efforts to, in earnest, try to really grow non-capital cities in Australia. So in comparison, just wanted to put up some benchmarks with sort of two other peer countries, if you will, uh, the United States and Canada. Um, in general, between the three, you'll find that American states have low measures of primacy with some notable exceptions like New York State, which has a very high measure. And so what you're looking at are the way that primacy has been measured here is you take the, the large, the primate city, the largest city's population as a proportion of the total urban population. And I put the red line to indicate high measures. So once, once the largest city is constituting over half of the urban population, you're getting into high territory. Um, when we move into Canada, Canada in general has usually higher measures of urban primacy than the United States. But when you compare, when you add Australia to the mix, you see Australia actually has much higher measures in general. These are very high measures. Anything over 80 is really incredible. Um, and I did two measures for Queensland uh, because often go, uh, you can measure Gold Coast as part of Brisbane or not. So I did those measures because some urbanists would say, well, Gold Coast is a part of the conurbation, so include it. If you do that, then 71% of the urban population is in greater Brisbane. And then other people would say, well, Gold Coast is its own thing. 
you'd still get a measure of 55%. So just to put it in perspective, Australia has extremely high measures of urban primacy in its states. And again, to show you visually, so this is a normal population density map. The red represents where most people are, or a high, high uh, number of people are. And then the cartogram expands it out to show you sort of where the weight really is in terms of population. And you can pretty much pick the capitals. And remarkably, you can even pick their geography. There's um, the bay by uh, Melbourne and uh, Sydney Harbor. So they're so big that you're actually getting to see that level of detail, uh, quite a lot of it. So typical historic explanation. So why would we study primacy? Surely someone's come up with a reason why we have it. And these are five sort of chestnuts that you'll find in the literature that explain primacy. And uh, many, many Australians could tell you these same exact reasons. Um, this isn't really something, many Australians are familiar that they have primacy and they can kind of tell you why they think it's there. So environment is a big one. Um, that said, I'll, I'll just comment that we did test for environmental factors and also, um, the, you can see this settlement pattern here sort of indicates where maybe the environment isn't so restrictive. To say that the environment is restricting settlement doesn't necessarily explain why settlement would be super concentrated. It could still be dispersed. So environment and primacy are not necessarily related. And there's lots of arid countries that don't have, not lots, but there are some arid countries that do not have primacy. So they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, modernization. So Australia was founded in a period of modernization. Maybe that's why it has urban primacy. We didn't need lots of centers. If that were the case, you would be expecting primacy to be on the rise around the world, that everything would, most countries would be consolidating as Australia has. That's really not the case in general. Primacy is on the decline in most countries. Um, isolation is another one. This is sort of relativist. Again, with Australia's neighbors becoming wealthier and more developed, you would then expect that the ABS would be projecting that primacy would be on the decline, not the increase. Um, so maybe in the beginning, Australia was isolated and that's why we, still, we started with primacy, but you might expect that that would be declining eventually. So that might also not be a great explanation. Low population, so that, that is a reason for primacy. Uh, however, some of our states are hitting urban populations over 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, even in New South Wales, uh, Victoria, we have 5 million. The threshold in the literature is about 2 million. When your urban population exceeds 2 million and you're still seeing primacy, you may begin to look at um, political institutional factors as opposed to environment or um, historical factors, or, although institutions in history are not to be disentangled, and I'll, I'll share more. And the last piece was first mover advantage. So the capitals were the first points of settlement. That's why they won, in a sense. That is a good explanation for why they are successful. It doesn't necessarily explain why they are the exclusive or the only um, cities. So first mover advantage is a great way to explain why a city is successful, but it's not a good explanation for its solitude. So just in summary, before we get into my project, so we have long-term, very high measures of primacy in states um, in general, which I hadn't shared yet, but the research of primacy in the literature for Australia does not engage with institutional economics. In general, the debate was put down in the 70s or 80s. Um, and meanwhile, internationally, it continued onward. And there's a lot of new ideas about what drives primacy that have not been applied here yet. Um, there's ongoing government interest as recent as 2019. The, the federal government is saying we're expecting a lot of population growth. We want people to spread out. We don't want hyper-congested capitals. How do we do it? Um, so the, my research question is sort of revisiting an old question. Why do we have urban primacy in states? So from institutional economics, just a bit of background, last bit of my lit review. In general, what scholars are saying is if you build it, they will come. Um, so yes, free market economics exists. That's, that's, they're not disagreeing with that, but they're saying that they are sculpted by the rules of the game. And I put a quote here um, from a paper that we are uh, publishing to sort of share the current thinking because people who are educated on economics will often say, well, you know, people go where there are jobs and that's that. Really, the rules of the game also have a lot to uh, say about where people are settling. Um, so when you talk about if you build it, people will come, you, the other follow-up questions are, well, what are they building? Who's building it? Um, how often are they building it? Where are they building it? And where do they get the money? What, with what funds? And when you can answer all these questions, you'll understand a lot about a settlement system because institutions dictate the answers to these questions. So the theory we're testing in my project is taking these, these settlement systems that we looked at in the beginning. This is the theory in general, a, a very simplified, uh, 
In this, theory, in this situation where you have decentralized development, you would expect that power as you move down from federal, state to local would increase or that they would have good ranges of autonomy. So if you cumulatively added up these governments, you'd have more power at the lower tiers than you would at the higher tiers. And this is why you're getting this because you've got bottom-up growth capabilities. These areas can grow regardless of their status, regardless of what the state or the federal government thinks of them. Whereas here, what you'll find is very centralized power. Um, and these entities are highly dependent on this centralized power, whether they do or do not grow. And in general, the centralized power tends to only develop itself. And there's no real recourse for these areas to grow, whether they like it or not. They don't have the powers or tools to do it, even if they wanted to and thought that they could. So we're testing, is that relevant in Australian states? That's our main question. And the way we're answering or uh, testing that question is, First, I ran some quantitative analyses, so uh, multiple linear regression. In effect, I'm looking for correlations between city populations and natural economic and political factors. And I'll, I'll break that down, but I'm wondering what correlates with big cities in Australia. Then um, those pyramids I showed, I wanted to create one for Australia. So in general, I did a qualitative, a content analysis to look at how is intergovernmental power configured in Australia between its tiers of government. And then lastly, um, I did a series of interviews with subject matter experts in regional development to see what do they think is going on? What, what do they, why do they think we have primacy? Um, and what do they think is going on? So just some of the factors that we tested in the correlate, correlative analyses. We looked at political factors, so whether the place was a state or federal capital. Um, natural factors, where its placement was um, in terms of longitude and latitude, that can help us to, it, for example, if one of them were significant, let's say a, there was a southeast bias in the sample, we might attribute that to historic or environmental factors. So this is a broad brush method used in the literature to capture things that you, you really can't capture in these models. You do have to be selective about what uh, variables you choose. Water has always been very important in Australian sediments. So we looked at navigable waterways. So that could be a river, a bay, in effect where a port could be or where you could uh, you know, navigate and, and develop. Rainfall, so were wetter or drier places. You know, was there a correlation between where people are choosing to be? The temperature, given Australia's arid climate, is that really putting people off? Um, and then infrastructure. So where infrastructure has been provided, where there's been economic development, um, such as a, a major uh, seaport or an airport. So which of these factors are correlating with population? By the way, we measured them once, once every decade for the century. So for the first census in 1911, and then I did separate regressions for every decade through to the last one in 2016. And our sample was approximately 100 major centers. Our, um, our uh, method for inclusion was if they had a population of 10,000 or more. So above everything else in every period, state capital city status was the strongest and primary predictor of size in the sample in every period. Um, economic infrastructure was usually significant, not in every period, but often. So if a place had a port or an airport, it usually had a significant correlation with population. Still, the state capital city status was more important. It had a bigger impact on population. Quantitatively, the environmental factors very rarely were significant, if at all. That said, our sample, only having 100 centers, spoke to environmental constraints. That's a small sample. If we had done the same, if we had used the same method in Canada, we would have had over 300 centers. So we're already, it's there, but in term, once you finally isolate the centers that do exist, um, it didn't really seem to differentiate, explain what differentiated them. So what that's telling you is that the capital is not necessarily climatic oases. So the climate does not explain why the capitals are so large. And what that means is there are centers with comparable natural endowments that are not large. Um, so our result, these results, so this component of the study suggests we have a politically derived primacy. Now this isn't definitive, but it did help us to uh, reduce some of the options and to, to sharpen our focus on what might be going on here. So qualitatively, I wanted to just for full disclosure, share with you some of the variables we looked at. I won't go through all of them, but in the literature, intergovernmental power is measured. So I went through that and pulled out different quantitative metrics to make our own measure to, to weight the power of each tier of government. So some of the political powers would be, you know, are, is leadership democratically elected? Um, can they be abolished? What are their safeguards of existence even? 
Um, do they have constitutional recognition? You know, does the federal government have constitutional recognition? In Australia, we know that's a yes. States, a yes. Um, fiscal measures are very important. So these measures look at how much revenue can the tier raise? How much revenue does the tier get to expend? Um, that expenditure would be looked at as a proportion of the national economy. I'll go through a couple of them. I've, I'm going to share some specific examples. Um, but these are good measures of how would you determine the relative weight and who's doing what in the federation. Administratively, we get down to real nuts and bolts. So who's providing electricity? Who's looking after water? Who's looking after transport, communications, social infrastructure? What are their overall rights? What are their overall permissions? So this is the pyramid for Australia. Um, I'll go through each power, what we, the, the, the high level observations and then talk to this uh, diagram. So in terms of local government, you can see is very weak. So in terms of political power, the existence and autonomy of local governments in Australia is uh, compromised. Uh, we looked at the existence of, uh, for those decades that I had done the correlations for with major centers, I did the same thing for local governments. And what you see when you compile those measures is states will just abolish all of the local governments and redraw the map. So that speaks to just their existence is compromised. Uh, fiscally, Australia, and this is not my idea, this is a whole literature. Um, Australia has extreme federal centralization. There's been an enormous trend since federation that the federal government has usurped almost all taxation power. About 80 to 85% of all taxation in Australia is done by the federal government and then they pass it out. Um, there's a low use of debt in local government as well. So that's really interesting. In some countries, and I'll, I have an example we can maybe go over, um, local government have the ability to not only borrow, but they can issue bonds on capital markets and seek funds from the capital markets. We have zero of that in Australia. Administratively, local governments actually do a fair bit, um, but the, they're doing what the states are prescribing that they do by and large. So what we have are comparably strong federal and state governments. Because of the federal government's fiscal omnipotence, it is a bit stronger, but states are very strong. You're seeing that with COVID. There's really no question that we have a strong federation. But when you get to the local tier, we almost still have this colonial setup where we have a very strong central authority and local governments, which have come leaps and bounds since colonization, by the way, are still very much creatures of the state. And they don't have a lot of power. I wanted to share these graphs because I find them interesting just to give you sort of an overview of what you're looking at. The solid line is the federal government's um, own source revenues um, as a proportion of the national economy, gross national product. So what you're looking at is the weight of their own source revenues or how much money they make in relative to the total economy in that year. So how big is their budget relative to the national economy? And the solid line in all three of these is the federal government um, the bigger dashes are states or provinces, and then the, the, the little dots are local government. And this is from these two, the U.S. and Canada, are from a different paper, from a paper that I really liked, and a lot of my project is sort of drawing from that as an Australian version. Um, and what you see in all three countries is that the World War, at World War II, all federal governments sort of spike, and they never really return to where they had been. Um, particularly in the United States, the federal government has become something it never was intended to be or, and, and it really hasn't ever come down to earth. And interestingly enough, in the United States, you see local governments were the most powerful fiscally tier coming into the 1900s. And they're still pretty strong. They're at 7% of gross national product. Remember that number seven, that's high. Canada is about five. They also historically had stronger local governments in their provinces. So both of these countries are coming from histories of strong local government, and that has a lot to do with their colonization. Whereas in Australia, what you can see right off the bat is local governments are very weak. They're at 1% here and 2% here. So still really weak. And again, this has probably got historical reasons. There, it was a harsh environment. It probably selected for strong central command just to survive. And, we, and because there's been no revolution, which is largely how these guys got here, and then maybe, they, maybe something a little different here. But there was no real disruption to the colonial way of doing things. It was more a, a, a transfer of power to the Federation. So there's been no real disruption here. And the federal government is obviously very strong. But this demonstrates local weakness. And I thought the comparison was really helpful. 
So I conducted uh, about 35 interviews with subject matter experts. They were semi-structured. So I had three or four prepared questions and then we sort of let it go where it went. And I started by clarifying what urban primacy meant. If they knew what it was, usually they would know what it was. Uh, it often goes by the term metropolitan dominance in Australia. And so I had asked them, why do you think Australian states exhibit primacy? Are there growth constraints in the regions? If so, what, what would you list among them? And should something be done about urban primacy? And if so, what? So some insights. Um, in terms of who we interviewed, we were fortunate enough to uh, have uh, these roles included. So state premier, federal and state ministers, local government CEOs or mayors, scholar, renowned scholars in this field or in economics, and other regional development SMEs like from regional development commissions. Um, so there were a couple areas where they were sort of unanimous without them knowing it, but in my, doing my analysis, um, it was pretty clear. I checked with them, you know, do you think, what's sub-state government like in Australia? Do you, after I'd asked them those initial questions, I showed them the theory and asked what they thought of it. And they all agree, you know, sub-state government in Australia is very weak, that there's no question. And the local government stakeholders really would go on about that. They had loads of examples of how that was true. They also tended to agree that primacy was a problem and they would normally lean on the congestion costs. That's what they would talk about more often, particularly the Perth-based people were concerned about growing congestion. And then regional leaders would talk to you about untapped potential and how they had projects in their queue that they felt would never really get off the ground because the state wouldn't permit them. Um, there was high variability about what should be done about it. Some people said, we sh yeah, it's a problem, but what can we do about it? Others had more direct ideas about what could be done. Um, they also agreed that institutional economics, that the theory appeared relevant to what was going on here, and that often sparked a lot of interest uh, because the, um, the connection between institutions and settlement, I think for all of them had not been made before. And that's sort of one of the contributions of this research is that um, while primacy is well studied in Australia, it's very rarely associated with the configuration of power through government. And more often than not, you'll hear particularly state officials say, you know, we would never want to give more power to local governments. They're totally incompetent. What basket cases? So they were sort of uncomfortable with that suggestion, and yet they were open that maybe there was something to it. So the last point, yeah, uh, about local empowerment. So speaking with them about in the literature in countries that need to decentralize, again, primacy is very common around the world. There's talk of devolution. So taking powers at higher tiers and building capabilities into the lower tiers. Usually it's from nation to state. So we're leaps and bounds ahead in that regard. Um, while they felt, yeah, that's logical, that makes sense. They also said politically, it just doesn't, that probably will never happen because of um, a culture of risk aversion and complacency. And again, I'm using uh, interviewee words. So in summary of the project, um, I think in, it's important to differentiate the, between the historical causes of how we got here. There is a, a valid, good history of why Australia ended up with its configuration of government. And, but it's important to differentiate that from the drivers of primacy today. And do they make sense going in the to the future? If we're expecting population to grow from what's today about 25 million to potentially 70 million, will it continue to make sense to have everyone concentrated in five cities? Um, and in general, while unique, because Australia's version of primacy is uh, at a sub-national level, it has a lot of consistencies with the international literature and international experience. And then in general, you know, solving urban primacy, and I have a few slides on this, requires understanding why non-capital cities are growing. So often when I would ask interviewees, why do you think we have primacy? They would tell me all about why Perth was successful. And then I would say to them, okay, that helps me to understand why Perth is successful. So why aren't non-capital cities growing? Because what you've said wouldn't necessarily preclude other cities from growing. And that's usually where they would get a bit stuck unless they were from the regions, then they would tell you all day about it. Um, so, as I shared, redressing primacy, the literature is pretty unanimous that you have to devolve power. You have to build capability downward. If, if that's really something you're about, if you really do want to decentralize population, then this has got to be part of it. And it requires building capability, a period of adaptation, and, and making sure that there are bottom-up growth capabilities. So I'll just do a time check. I had, I'm, I'm happy to stop and do q and I had three other topics. I also was gonna briefly share where large non-capital cities even are in the world. I had, a, again, a brief case study of primacy disruption. 
to show what that looks like. And then the last one was uh, often in these talks, I'll get asked a lot of questions about, in, a, in essence, birth, city birth, because people will want to debate about, you know, why Perth and no other places have grown. So I was going to talk about the birth of a large non-capital city in an arid environment. So I don't know where we are on time, but. One, two, three, two. Mm -hmm. yep. So, um, yeah. We'll stop. We'll yeah, then. cool. Yeah, we'll just uh, leave it out. Uh, 10, 10, 15 minutes of questions. Thank you very much, George. That was a really interesting Thanks. presentation. Thank you. Um, so I guess we'll just bring it down to um, the floor now for some questions and answers. So uh, for those that are online, please raise your hand and uh, we'll, we'll call you out for any questions. So I see that Sam, Sam Jardin, you have a question. So if you'd like to turn on your mic and um, ask away. Uh, yeah, so first of all, fantastic presentation, lots of really great information. So uh, a couple of thoughts. First of all, have you looked at um, John Hurst's work on Australian history? I don't think so. Right, so he's, I mean, he doesn't work um, in sort of the qualitative space, but his essential argument is, he, he makes an argument about Australia having a particular and quite distinctive political evolution, which, res which is the cause, substantially, of its very strong centralised uh, state versus its very weak regional governments. So that might potentially be of interest to you. Thank you. Um, and I forgot the other question I was going to ask you, so I'll pass it on to the next person. Thank you, Sam. Um, I have a question for you, George. Sure. Um, oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Um, I think it's really interesting how, um, I guess you had a, you, you did primarily contrast between um, Australia, Canada, and the US. So that's the first thing. I'm just wondering, is there like an intersection given the fact that they all came from British colonial um, histories? And would you find something different, say, if you went to the Middle East or to East Asia? Yeah. Like, would you find something different? Would you expect it? You would, I think. Uh, so good observation. Part of the reason I focused on those three was because they have comparable institutional history. So it's interesting to see how they have diverged. Um, I, when I just, I sometimes will talk about primacy as disease. I don't mean to have the value judgment, but primacy is sort of like a, you end up in a hospital with the same disease, but everybody has a different reason for how they got it. So it has, it, it's one of the most interesting things is how, um, there are similarities culturally between primate urban systems, despite being wildly different cultural entities. So in terms of what's driving it, the top-down power dynamic is fairly consistent internationally. So whether we're talking um, Bang uh, uh, Thailand, Philippines, Chile, Argentina, Mexico, France, Australian states, even some of the American states that have it, Canadian provinces that have it, you're going to see that the lower tiers of government are compromised in some way, shape, or form. And how they've gotten there, though, is going to be totally different. They have all very different histories of the institutional decisions that they've made. So to some degree, you're drawing a lot from the historical narrative of how they came to be as well, to mm. understand context. Yeah. yeah. Um, the second question, I'm so sorry. But um, <laughs> uh, so when you, when you spoke about WA and how Perth was a very um, concentrated um, urban primacy, Perth in particular. Um, it made me think about how a few years ago they had a project that was run by the state called Royalties for Regions. Mm. And this initiative was to essentially try and kickstart these regional areas like places like Newman, um, places like Port Hedland, in order to boost the population. Um, but these ones were heavily driven in partnership between the state and mining companies. But from what I know, Royalties for Regions didn't really work out in the end. Mm -hmm. It wasn't very successful, um, especially because it was so dependent on a mining as a primary economic source. So can you provide some commentary about this notion of power? I mean, not just about state, federal or local power, but also the economic drivers that's actually mm -hmm. forming the success rate of decentralization. Mm -hmm. Well, royalties is a really interesting program and um, state, you're right. A lot of people at the state or in the capital would say it wasn't that successful. Regional people will say they liked it. They didn't want it to end. There were some flaws. 
Um, what's interesting about royalties for regions, I, and tell me if I'm not answering your question completely, um, it's very similar to other initiatives tried before in that this a centralized top is going to try to orchestrate decentralization by giving gifts in effect. We're going to sprinkle money around and that should fix it. And this is common internationally. It happens all over the world. Um, there was no true devolution of power, though, nothing lasting at all. And that's really the key. So we, I spoke with a couple of the architects of uh, royalties who said, you know, we're, I, we're still stopped in the street on a daily basis thanking us for doing this, that people in the regions are really appreciative. And they did apparently try to bake in more permanent local power and decision making. Because I asked me, you know, was devolution ever part of the debate? When you had the opportunity, did you, did you try to bake in some more stronger regional or local power? And uh, they said yes, although as they answered, I wasn't sure they really understood what I meant by devolution. But I think they felt that the best they could do was grab some cash while they could, and that that was really the only, the only lasting appetite. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that's really interesting. So it's almost like at the, at the policy formation phase, at the, very, at the outset, you probably need to have some clarity around that in order to provide some license to mm -hmm. create that grassroots um, yeah. initiative. And that's what's missing. That and the political point. appetite. And the problem with primate systems is the populations tend to mostly be in the capital, particularly when it's very extreme. So it's hard to get regional interests represented in any real way. And, and devolution is also difficult because particularly if it's like in chile for example they're doing a constitutional reform because they have primacy a lot of congestion issues and there's talk about strengthening what their equivalent of states but their state their federal government is the same view our state does of local government well they don't have capability we can't trust them with more power we need to nanny this or it's going to fall on its face in fact there should be less of them we should amalgamate more of them and while there's a track record behind it, there's also sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy in my view. They've never really been given the chance. But um, the way the legislation is written, in Australia at least, is um, the state is on the line if local governments fail. Whereas if you go to the United States, their local governments are really interesting and they have many large non-capital cities, cities that are not capitals of states. Um, and Fiscally, states are not responsible for lo how local governments do. That's written in the legislation. So like Detroit, for example, when it went bankrupt 10, 15 years ago, the state of Michigan wasn't liable for those debts that they had that now were being wiped clean. Um, whereas if a local government were to go into debt in Australia and fail, the state will end up paying those debts to the federal government. So there's a reason that, you know, structurally, they're sort of all tied together. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. Bernardo, yeah, Bernardo, would you like to ask a question, please? Hey, yeah, sorry, I was writing the question on the chat. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to hear more about the key informants and uh, that you use as part of your qualitative research and the crit criteria you use to select them, and if they were all from the administration sector or yeah or more you, you uh -huh. also uh conducted interviews with uh yes business people or yeah to hear more about that sure um we did get some private and public sector it, um so i put a list here of the roles that we got uh because i thought we might get this question so we had a uh, federal minister federal senator so um obviously elected officials, state minister elected. We had state department CEOs, so career public servants, um, regional development commission CEOs, again, career public servants, uh, not pro nonprofit organizations. I don't know if you call those public servants that a lot of their backgrounds are not public service. Um, like regional Australia Institute, we had um, represent representation from there. Um, local government CEOs, so their career, uh, whereas mayors, presidents are elected. Um, we spoke with the LGA association, with LGA associations. Uh, some of them were retired, some were current, by the way. I'm not saying all of these were current people. Um, economic geography professors, so they were scholars. Um, we had various different scholars. Some were really expert in different, not economic geography so much as local government or, or federal, federalism in general. 
And then we did speak with some private, like pure private sector consultants who worked in like infrastructure. So they interface with the public sector uh, and usually an infrastructure provision, one of whom worked on royalties for regions um, with a global consultancy. So um, we were interested to speak with them. So that was our cohort. And last thing, the, the scholars were chosen on the works that they had written on the topic. So um, they either had dealt with primacy or had a, in their work had, you know, demonstrated expertise in federalism that they would be able to respond to our questions with knowledge. Most of these people very quickly knew what I was on about. Um, and so we could plug right into the debate and I could get their take on what was going on. Okay, thank you. Sam, do you have another question for us? Yes, sorry, I, I, did, I did remember the other thing I wanted to um, <laughs> ask you about. Um, so I was wondering, have you considered sort of the extent to which the opportunity cost, and perhaps especially the non-economic opportunity cost of uh, living outside of the urban centres is what helps reinforce this as a sort of path dependency where urban primacy reproduces itself because uh because the urban centers in australia are so dominant the gulf between them and communities outside of the urban centers is vast and it's a very stark lifestyle choice and this so if you are particularly concerned with things like uh education with cultural opportunities whatever that happens to look like um all of these things draw people towards the cities um so i perhaps what i'm getting at here is that this is not really something that can be easily rectified by moving money around or even by creating employment opportunities yeah i hear your question so it, it is difficult and there's huge opportunity costs to move to the regions in the current state as things are um i had a let me just pull up a slide here i prepared um so i wanted to just share a case study of the birth of a large non capital city because i think it would explain some of what what you're asking about so currently if you wanted to move to karatha for example and a lot of the people in the regions will say we have trouble holding on to people particularly when their kids hit high school because there's no good schools here, so they all move to the capital. Um, and that makes sense. So when you think about places that have that, and it, you're talking about infrastructure and that the capital in general, what you're talking about are social pieces of infrastructure that the capital has a, sort of a monopoly on. And why is that? Um, and so what you find with the birth of large non-capital cities is they have the power to provide those pieces of infrastructure. And it's not so much about moving money around. We, I wouldn't suggest that in our current system. It's that they have completely different taps of money on. So I'm going to just share uh, an American example because the U.S. does tend to have a monopoly on the existence of large non-capital cities, that is cities that are not capitals of states or the Federation of Los Angeles is one of them. It's not a capital of anything. And I wanted to just show some pictures of what it looked like uh, at a time when Perth was being founded. This, is a, this was an area that had been Mexico for three centuries. Mexico has primacy. The United States invaded Mexico's uninhabited north, which its primate capital assumed nothing could happen with. Um, and one of the differences is, or, or what allowed the United States institutions, I believe, to change that area, is you had the, local governments had the ability to raise revenue for whatever piece of infrastructure they thought was relevant. And one of the first pieces was to irrigate the desert. So Los Angeles is probably in its natural state as lovable as some more regions of our north. It's, it's not. Um, there's probably not much that grows higher than your kneecap in terms of live, standing out there and being comfortable. And this picture here is of the Los Angeles Aqueduct, which was bankrolled off of a municipal bond. And what that is was a local government put up, almost like you would list stocks on the stock market, put up a bond to build this uh, pipeline in Los Angeles. It's credited with giving birth to the city. And it didn't end there. The bond market um, funds two thirds of infrastructure in the United States. And these are, they're putting, you know, roads and buildings and stuff, but it also includes schools, universities, usually use infrastructure or um, municipal bonds to deal with uh, 
shortfalls, hospitals, a lot of the social infrastructure is paid for by that. And what you find in our, in our state, all of that provision is dependent upon the state and naturally the state will, will provide them where the people are. Um, the U.S. has a grants queue too. It's not that the, there's anything wrong with that approach or using grants in that way. It's that we don't have a municipal bond market at all because we, we haven't given local governments the autonomy to manage that kind of responsibility yet. Uh, it may be come in the future. I think you would find though, in answer to your question, that if we did, if local governments had um, more revenue streams, they can tell you all the projects they want to put in. They right. include schools. So, uh, so yeah. I, th I, think that, I think that if local governments did have more revenue streams, you could make a plausible case that they would be able to serve the local populations better and potentially attract more people. But I think sort of what I'm getting at is that the gulf between the primate, primate cities and the outlying regions is so vast that it is not something that could be bridged through this sort of incremental improvement. Like if this had been available 70 years ago or something, when the gap was less extreme, potentially it could have, but that's no longer the case. Um, I also think Los Angeles is in its own way it raises another interesting point, which I'll be very quick about because I realize we're running out of time, is that uh, the turn of the century, and I mean, America in particular, as the cliche goes, was all about opportunity. People were opening up new parts of the world and they were developing things and transforming the landscape. Whereas contemporary Australia, uh, to greater or lesser extents, there's sort of a pervasive sensation of decline in large parts of the country outside of the region. Like there is a sense that the population is aging, that we can't retain people. And because of that, that sort of potentially creates a feedback loop where people are unwilling to commit to it. So yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, I think I heard that a lot in my interviews as well. I think, you know, that, that's, that's one thing. And I, if, if that's the case, then the federal government needs to stop spending money on decentralization and, and giving it lip service. I think that would be what I, my first response is, then let's just stop talking about it. Um, in terms of LA being unique, I think there are dozens of very similar stories in the US and Canada. Not well. necessarily unique, just that that period of time, it, the, sort of, this the social of, atmosphere was different from contemporary. Uh, yeah. Well, look, I, that may be the case, this resignation and, and sort of leaving the North unpopulated and, and, and you know, I guess, landing in the five capitals forever. I, what I would just share is this case. I, um, so I had also mentioned that Mexico, you know, for three centuries, Los Angeles was part of it. Mexico used to be for three centuries, twice its size. Um, and as history would have it, another country uh, came and took those lands. And a lot of the resignation you're describing characterizes Mexican culture and what they believe of their North, which is cowboy country, inhospitable, no one lives up there. Um, and as soon as you cross the border, you can see what occurred since it was invaded in 1850. I, I'm not, I don't know if that would happen here, but I do think what this case shows is the potential that could be sitting in the, in the shadow of a primate city. So, um, it would be a shame to sort of not explore that. I think that's one of the most interesting things about urban primacy is what's sitting in its shadow. Um, I had another, yeah. You know, in Mexico to this day, if you look at their north, I, I had the satellite picture there. It's not, it's not hugely settled. Um, and then you have uh, three alpha world cities in, in, his, in historical texts in areas that they believe were completely inhospitable and useless and worthless. Um, nothing can be done there. Let's not do anything there. Let's just keep investing in Mexico City, which they still are doing. Um, so I, 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 you know, that's an interesting question. I think it's a little beyond the scope of my project. I, I hear you though. I don't disagree with you at all. I think you're, I think you're right. I think it's a shame, but at least um, I hope our research sort of dispels ideas of what's driving primacy. And you know, if people really, if the government really wants to do something about it, then let's get serious and start talking about devolving power. Or, or leave it alone and, and save money because it, it, these programs are not cheap. They're throwing money all around the place and it's just tokenism really, it's, yeah. Um, 
So I think we've only got time for one more question. So, um, Sylvia, yes, please ask a question. Thank you so much for your presentation. Sorry for being late, but um, talk a lot of uh, kind of like <laughs> kind of ideas. Uh, first of all, I'm looking from sustainability point of view. So a lot, we talk a lot about the economic costs and what that brings to the city, but I think it's just as important because of the social elements like aging or like population distribution, like um, mining culture, as well as the environment. I don't think it's outside the city, which I think is probably one of the main drivers for like, people living in small regional towns. That can be quite beneficial. Um, I did read a study on this in terms of what's economic mining and what that brings. What is the original town that is more mining? What else is there? And actually, there's a lot more of the, the industry that can be sustained with pasture and trees. But my interest was in specific from a cultural point of view, which is the most actually cultural kind of aspect. Um, obviously, I'm not too familiar with the context of North America, but in terms of Australia, we have indigenous population. And I think this element probably needs to be at least taken some sort of consideration. And the reason I take it from the text is because what happens in the territory is also the North territory intervention, the North Pacific Party policy, which essentially saw kind of pushed away a lot of the indigenous population to the main cities because there was less services available. There was simply no way to move from small communities to small towns. So they were kind of and the criticism for the non territory intervention was that it was purposefully to put off the land for future exploration, mining, and operations. Now, that's um, one way of the story. Obviously, there are other um, ways to interpret that story, but there are those policies that have been implemented in federal local government that have also perhaps influenced the, the way that cities. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks. Uh, I had an interesting interaction with a former elected uh, member of the Labour Party in WA. I ended up getting really good meetings as a result of this conversation because he brought up, he recognized basically what we were describing is there's a lack of local choice and decision making and regional choice and decision making in the states. And he spoke a lot about Aboriginal um, decision making and their communities and how he thought that was a big problem that were decisions were being made for them and that they weren't able to make decisions um, and he ended up calling on other colleagues of his in the party who I got an audience with who hadn't been replying to my requests <laughs> after that meeting because I think they saw a connection between may potentially I, I don't know to what extent but addressing some of these equity issues by looking at the devolution of power that maybe it was a more effective way to support those communities. Now, where it goes, I don't know, but it, I just thought it was really interesting because I never would have expected the interviews to go in that direction. But um, yeah, we've probably spent most of the hour talking about that. Thanks for sharing. Um, well, thank you. Thank you again, uh, George, for presenting a very interesting research Thank you. Um, with us and um, I understand there might be a few more questions that are coming through online so please feel free to contact George directly to continue this conversation with him. Um, so uh, just letting you all you know next week will be study week so we'll be taking an intermission from the seminars and we'll be uh, reconvening on the 17th of September where our very own Jorinda will be presenting. Um, so we do hope that you all have a lovely semester break and that um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you all again um, in a couple of weeks time. So take care and thank you again. Thanks, Jorinda. thanks for the engagement and the opportunity. Thank you. Well done.